Good evening. Welcome to Sunday evening worship services. We'll have two songs before the prayer and scripture reading and one more song before the lesson. First song this evening will be number 58, 58. A wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord, a wonderful Savior to me. He hides my soul in the cleft of the rock, where rivers of pleasure I see. He hides my soul in the cleft of the rock, that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hides my life in the depths of his love, and covers me there with his hand. And covers me there with his hand. A wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. He taketh my burden away. He orders me up and I shall not be moved. He giveth me strength as my stay. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shatters a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. With numberless blessings each moment each cross and filled with his fullness divine I sing in my rapture to glory to God for such a redeemer as mine. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shatters a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. When clothed in his brightness, Ported I rise to meet him in clouds of the sky. His perfect salvation, his wonderful love, I'll shout with the millions on high. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shatters a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand, and covers me there with his hand. The song before the prayer and scripture reading will be number 324, 324. Lord's our rock, in him we hide, a shelter in the time of storm. Secure whatever ill be tied, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land. A shelter in the time of storm. A shade by day deepens by night. A shelter in the time of storm. No fears alarm, no foes affright. A shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock and a weary land. A weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock and a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. The raging storms may round us beat, a shelter in the time of storm. We'll never leave our safe retreat, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock and a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock and a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. A rock divine, a refuge dear, a shelter in the time of storm. Be thou thy helper ever near, a shelter in the time of storm. 
Let us pray. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this time we have to come together to sing these songs of praises to you and come before you in prayer. We're so blessed, Father, for all those things you do for us to ensure us that through your Son we have that chance for eternal life to be there in heaven with you, whom that's, who our goal, that's what our goal is, each and every one of us here. We're so thankful for those blessings that you have given us in that pathway that we have. We pray, Father, for our families as, as we raise them, that we raise them in the Lord. As we know through the scriptures, and if we raise them as we are taught, that things would be so much better. That you are and a provider for all, for us to understand that. We're so thankful, Father, that... We have the Mid Ohio Valley here as our place to worship, and our friends that we, we come across, and we want everyone to go to heaven and be there too, Father. And it's a hard, hard course to, to travel, and you know that, Father. But we ask for the strength that we have to, to overcome these barriers that we always get. But we know through strength through each other and here at this congregation that we can accomplish through your son and through you anything that we set our minds to. And we pray, Father, that we can do these things. We, we pray for each brother and sister what we have here, the problems that we have, the situations that occur, that we can work through those as we continue to study your word and understand what our responsibilities are as human beings as people that you created, what we were supposed to do, not what we want to do. Everything in the scriptures is so true, and it gives us our guide. We ask, Father, that we pay attention to those things. We're thankful for our speaker tonight that's going to come and give us words of encouragement, things that are so true, things that we can live by, so that we can go out and accomplish here in the middle of Ohio Valley to preach the truth so everyone will have that chance for eternal life before destruction comes. Because after death, it will be judgment. Let us understand that whatever age we are, that in whatever situations we come, that we come to know the truth. And the truth is your son, Jesus Christ, who died for each and every one of us for our sins. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Today's scripture reading is Psalm 46, verses 1 through 3. Psalm 46, verses 1 through 3. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. Number 430, 430. If you're able to, please stand. Mm-hmm. Oh, the blessed rock of ages, rock of ages, I am trusting now, dear Lord, in thee, dear Lord, in thee, I'm trusting. Keep me till my journey's ended, journey's ended, keep me till thy blessed face I see. I be a blessed rock of ages, till thy blessed face I see, thy face I see in glory. When the storm around me rages, around me rages, blessed rock of ages, hide thou me. Keep me when the storm clouds gather, storm clouds gather, keep me till the 
sun come shining through, come shining through the shadows. Keep me till my work is over, work is over. Keep me till I bid this world adieu. I be a blessed rock of ages. Till thy blessed face I see, thy face I see in glory. When the storm around me rages, round me rages, blessed rock of ages, hide thou me. When my journey is completed, Completed Savior, and there's no more work to do, no work to do, oh blessed Savior, guide my weary spirit, weary spirit to the happy land, me on the blue, hide me, a oh, blessed rock of ages, till thy blessed face I see, thy face I see in glory, when Storm around me rages, round me rages, blessed rock of ages, hide thou me. Psalm final lesson will be number 564. 564. This weekend, we're welcoming Joshua Ball uh, with us in the family of Morgan and Charlie and Oliver. And Joshua is speaking to us throughout the day. If you weren't here this morning, you missed an excellent study on Ecclesiastes and a, and a wonderful message on the Transfiguration. And this evening, Joshua is going to speak to us on the topic of God is our refuge. Joshua? As I said this morning, I am uh, very I'm glad to be able to be here. It is a privilege to be among folks that I know and uh, meeting all sorts of folks that I've uh, yet to meet. And uh, it's always, always, always a good time to be able to talk about Jesus, talk about God, the gospel plan. And uh, this evening, I want us to focus upon a passage in the Old Testament. Uh, actually, whenever I was, was talking with Kurt and Roger, one of the plans for the sermons and the class uh, was for the class to continue on the Ecclesiastes class on Sunday mornings. Uh, but for the Sunday morning and the Sunday evening services, uh, it was asked something from the New Testament and something from the Old. So this morning we looked at the Mount of Transfiguration and the, the great change that happened there. Uh, this evening we are talking in the Old Testament, but we're not going to just stay in the Old Testament because the things that we learn there do apply to us today. And we're going to be talking about God as our refuge. And one of the beautiful things about the Bible is that all throughout it, you will read all sorts of different analogies and illustrations describing what the church is like, what God the Father is like, what us as a church is like. And it's, it's wonderful because Depending on where you are in your life and in your experience, you're going to resonate more with some than others. God in the Bible is described as a father, a lord, a king, creator, and others. We as uh, his children are described as his children in some places, sheep, servants, saints, and other things. Church overall is described sometimes as a temple. It's described as a kingdom, a family, a field, and others. You know, now being a father, I, I appreciate and understand the father-child description of God and his uh, uh, Christians. I, I appreciate that much more than what I did before I had children. Likewise, there might be people that if you are a, a farmer, you will appreciate the agrarian descriptions that are brought up in the Bible. But one of the, the descriptions that I really enjoy looking at is God as a refuge. Now, whenever we think about refuge or refugee, typically our minds gravitate towards something political today. Uh, not Everybody knows some of the details about the Old Testament cities of refuge that we're going to discuss. 
But typically, somebody that is a refugee is somebody that is escaping from something that is awful. Uh, I was never aware of, in Columbus, Ohio, how many refugees live in the city. A massive Somali population uh, in Columbus that all came from you know, Somalia, as a, uh, and they got refugee status. Uh, I just found out there's a huge Nepalese uh, population, a lot of people from Nepal. I had no clue. But here they are, are people that are escaping someplace that is awful, and they are in a need for something. Now, for us today, it ends up becoming a hot-button political issue, and so I just avoid that. Uh, but in the Old Testament times, you want to under if you wanted somebody to explain what it would be like to be a refugee, the Old Testament Jews could tell you exactly what it was like. They were captive and kept as slaves, not once, but twice. And technically the second time was by multiple groups. They had multiple times had to flee from very, very difficult places. They were captive, enslaved, they needed something to look forward to, some way to answer their questions of what do I do when I am oppressed. And so God hardwired in the Old Testament laws rules on how Jews could be taken care of from, uh, from needing to run away from uh, bad situations. Now, obviously, whenever they were enslaved in Egypt and up in Babylon, that's not something that they could get out from. But in their judicial system, there was something for protecting against one another. What the, way, the way that this was handled was through cities of refuge. So even if today we are not political refugees, we are unquestionably refugees when it comes to sin and struggles and trials in life. Things that we are trying to run away from and we desperately need support from the Lord with. This verse that we have looked at is a perfect example of how God is our refuge and a very present help in our times of trouble. My mom, whenever she went through her breast cancer treatments, that was one of her go-to verses that she would consider whenever she would go through chemo. It is an encouragement because God is indeed our refuge. So let's look at it tonight and how God fits this role. First of all, God is our help. God is our help. I'm, I'm breaking down the, the key words in that passage that we read where God is a present help. Cities of Refuge, their job was to provide care for people that were in desperate need. We read about the cities of refuge in Numbers chapter 35. And I'll read verses 11 and 12 here. Uh, giving the instructions to the Israelites on what to do. It says, Then you shall select cities to be cities of refuge for you, that the manslayer who kills any person without intent may flee there. The cities shall be for you a refuge from the avenger, that the manslayer may not die until he stands before the congregation for judgment. Short explanation for what would happen. If an Israelite intentionally killed somebody, no, that was just, that was an automatic no, that person is going to be killed. But if there was an accidental death, or, or it was hard to tell whether there was intent or not, if there was manslaughter, instead of somebody being arrested or in our culture, we just know don't mess with them until the police officers will arrest them and the, the law will take care of it. In, in the biblical times here, if somebody killed my family member, I now am justified to kill that person. Uh, and so if you accidentally killed somebody, you knew you immediately had a target on your back because somebody from that family was gunning for you. And so what you had to do is you had to get out of town. You had to flee. And so God established these cities of refuge that as long as you were in those walls and you made it there, you were not allowed to be killed by the avenger of that family. 
So there was one person that would be designated the avenger, and they would go and they would try to kill the person that killed your relative. And so once they were there, if the killer was ruled of guilty intent, they were handed over to the avenger to be killed. But if they were ruled innocent, they could live in that city of refuge um, for the rest of their days, or at least until the high priest died. Now, that's another little tidbit in there. But they, they could stay there in peace and be fine in the city. Thus, that city of refuge was a place of help and strength. Whenever you felt like things were coming down on you, you knew that death was coming for you, you could run to that city and you could plead your case in order to be kept from harm. Our God definitely fits the bill for that refuge. He is our refuge and he is stronger than anything that we face. You think about the walls of that city and thankfully the walls of those cities were a whole lot stronger than the anger of somebody coming after you. Likewise, God is stronger than anything that we face in this life. He is stronger than our sins. Most importantly, He is stronger than our sins. We do sin, Romans 3.23. We fall short of the glory of God. But no sin that we have is greater than God's ability to forgive us when He has promised that He will do so. But we have to go to God about that, and we'll discuss it uh, in a second. But whenever we sin, we really need to think of it like we are being chased down. We are being chased down by God seeking judgment for what we do, so we need to go to God, actually, to find our judgment, uh, our, our salvation from our judgment. But it's also like Satan is trying to chase us down, too, to drag us down to hell where we belong after doing such evil in our sins. We need to run to God because he is the only one that can save us from those consequences. But if God can help us in our sins, everything else is really going to be small. God can help us in all of our trials, and all of those trials are trivial in comparison to, uh, to God and to, well, taking care of our sins. Cancer, disease, old age, all these things are coming for us and might be affecting some here. All of us are facing down trials of life in one way or another. Anxiety and depression may be upon some here. And even though that might not be a literal death that is coming for us, it certainly feels like death is coming for us. What do we do when we have the fear of death and the fear of fear coming upon us? We go to God. Because all of these things, big or small, are still nothing compared to the grace and the kindness and the mercy of Jesus Christ. Consider David as an example. That David, whenever he was being chased down by Saul, literal threat of death, he had to run away so that he would not be killed. He was emotional. And many of the Psalms are, are written from his perspective on being fearful. And after Saul died, David wrote a song. David sang in 2 Samuel chapter 22, verses 2 and 3, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield, the horn of my salvation, my stronghold and my refuge, my Savior, you save me from violence. God is the only one that we can truly go to for peace. And so we need to. Whether they are emotional burdens, whether they are physical burdens, or whether they are sins, we go to God. But God is not just a help, he is a present help. He is a help now. Cities of refuge were placed in strategic places by God uh, around Israel so that people could go there quickly. Numbers chapter 35 verse 15 reads, These six cities shall be for refuge for the people of Israel and for the stranger and for the sojourner among them, that anyone who kills any person without intent may flee there. That is 
uh, it, it, the six cities is what uh, I'm wanting to emphasize here. There are six cities. Three of them were placed on the east side of the Jordan River. Six were placed on the other side. And they were all placed so that wherever you lived in Israel, it was a one day's journey, at least one day's journey away to get to the nearest city of refuge. You had to go, but it wasn't going to be so far that it was impossible to go to. It was a blessing that they were spread out. God cared for people enough to do such. What matters to us here is, is that God's help is not a distance away, but it is near for all to receive. This gets into an interesting thought about how far away is God. He's not far away. He is here. God is far, far closer than any city that was around. Because God is present now. God is spirit and he is not limited by things, physical things like geography. Uh, I recall, uh, I used this uh, illustration this morning whenever I visited Japan. Uh, and visiting in Japan, and I went and I saw all these tourist spots. And one of the places I wanted to visit was one of the temples for their Shinto shrines. Uh, just out of curiosity to see what these other religions were like. And so I visited the shrine, and I, I had to travel across the city to be able to go to one of them. And I noticed they had several things that were very strange to me. One of them is that they had a big old box in the front of wherever you would go to the shrine. And the box had little uh, angled slants, triangular slats that went all the way down. And people were to come up and they were to take their money because you got to pay for the God. Uh, and you take it and you throw your coins in. And those angles on those slats made the coins bounce around and jump and make a very loud noise. And then once you did that, they had many times a bell that you would go and you would ring. Or people would clap their hands multiple times. And I, I had to ask somebody what the, the bell and the clapping was for. And it was to call attention to the God. Their God was off and needed to be called attention to. So not only would you have to cross a city to get to the place to go talk to your God, you would have to make a big old racket to get his attention to be able to listen to your prayer in the first place. We see something similar, obviously, in the Old Testament with uh, the Baal worshipers and Elijah on Mount Carmel where they were cutting themselves and yelling out. And Elijah started mocking them for that. Our God is not like that. Our God is not a far-off God that we have to struggle and, and trouble ourselves over to reach. He is not limited by geography. In John chapter 4, verse 24, Jesus says, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The context of that passage is Jesus talking with the Samaritan woman at the well. And uh, to try to change the subject away from her uh, questionable marriage history, uh, she starts saying, well, you're a prophet. Uh, you Jews worship in a temple. We Samaritans worship on a mountain. Which one's right? And Jesus' answer was simple. He said, well, it's the Jews. It's at the temple. But the time is coming and is now here where we worship in spirit and in truth. Jesus is saying here that the spiritual aspect of things means we are not limited by geography. Brothers and sisters, friends that are visiting, God is here in this place. God is here in this place not because these four walls are somehow holy and sanctified. They're just four walls. But God is everywhere so that wherever you are out in your path and in your journey, whenever you have trials, either spiritual or physical, God is there to listen to your prayer immediately. God is present. But God still expects us to move. I mentioned that it's a little tricky whenever it comes to God and talking about things. Even though God is everywhere... God still expects and demands that we move. Consider the man born blind in John chapter 9. 
Jesus spit on the ground, made mud, anointed the man's eyes, and then he said, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. But God could have just done it right there. He's, he's God in the flesh. Why could he not do that right there? Well, he could. But Jesus wanted the man to do something. He needed to be engaged in the process. And so he said, go and wash. Naaman the Syrian, whenever he had leprosy, he was told to go dip in the Jordan River. Why is it that God and God's people insist that we do things and move? We are called to obey God in order to receive gifts that we do not deserve. God wants us to participate in the process. I, uh, <laughs> one of my go-to analogies, uh, just because it, it completely boggled my mind when I learned about it. Uh, as a kid, you know, my sister, Rachel, and I, we would wash the dishes. And, you know, we're like five, six years old, we would wash the dishes. And I forget the context where I was at, but I was mentioning uh, that we washed dishes, and my dad was nearby, and he said, oh, we wash those things again. And uh, I didn't... <laughs> I was like, here I was thinking that I was a good washer of dishes when I was five and six years old. And no, I was not. Uh, and like, why would you do that? He's like, you needed to learn to wash dishes. All right? It's, you still, even though we cannot do anything to earn our salvation. We cannot do anything to earn God's favor. That's not how that works. But you better not mistake us not being able to earn those things for God just saying, sit around and do nothing. He wants us to participate in the process because he wants us to be involved and engaged in the process. And so we need to go to God. For receiving salvation, we need to do what he asks. As my mom would always say, if, uh, if he told me to stand on my head for, you know, for anything. She's like, well, you can stand on your head for that long if you have to do something. If God told us to stand on our heads in order to receive salvation, then we better stand on our heads to receive that free gift of salvation. I'm guaranteeing you, standing on your head ain't going to earn anything. Being dunked in water ain't going to earn you anything. But God has promised us that being immersed in water, whenever we are doing so for the remission of our sins, repenting, turning away from what we've done, we will receive salvation because that is his gift. And as a gift, he gets to set the standards. He gets to tell us exactly how he wants that to happen. But for our struggles, yeah, we need to get up, we need to be able to go and, and hear God do what he asks for, for the steps of salvation. Whenever we're having any kind of struggles, pray, pray. God is always a prayer away. In the final place, God's refuge is immovable. God is immovable. In the passage in Psalms, it talks about how though everything shake, even the mountains quake and shake and things move, even though everything around us might feel like chaos, feels kind of appropriate for what we've been going through the last couple of years to me. It says, even though everything else be moved, God's presence is still there. And that is absolutely the case for us today. Staying inside of the city of refuge was the only assurance that a person had from dying at the hand of the avenger. Continue on in Numbers 35, verses 26 and 27. But if the manslayer shall at any time go beyond the boundaries of his city of refuge to which he has fled, and the avenger of blood finds him outside of the boundaries of the city of refuge, and the avenger of blood kills the manslayer, he shall not be guilty of blood. The rule was, if you were found innocent, you could stay inside of that city and you would stay inside there as long as possible because inside of that, those walls was safety and security. But if you walk even a couple steps outside of that city and that person is waiting for you, they could kill you and get away scot-free. It would be no problem at all. The only exception to this, as I mentioned before, was the death of the high priest. That kind of just, for some reason, God just said, that's a, 
that's a wash then. It's like at that point, nobody can kill anybody. You're free to go. Uh, and that was a nice little out for getting early. Um, I wonder how many people wanted the high priest to die. Um, that would be kind of awkward. But God provided a, a way for, for that to work, that people could leave. And if the Avenger died too and the family died, then, of course, you were free to leave. But the only way that you could guarantee safety was to remain where you are at. The immovable nature of God is both a warning and an encouragement to us. If we depart from God, he is not going to leave his position to rescue us. This is kind of a, a, a frightening concept, but it's something that we really understand deep down if we think about it. God is not going to protect people that turn away from his protection. As long as we want to be protected by God, that we have come to him in the way that he has asked, and we are kept in his favor. If we say, I don't want this anymore, and I'm going to leave, God is not going to force us to, be, to stay in that city. That is not his job. He does not want to do that because that is not loving, even remotely, to say, I am going to keep you safe and you will stay here forever. No, that's called creepy. And that's not something that we want. God gives us the free choice to decide what we want to do. Paul cited what is probably a first century song in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. That's a very, it's a curious passage, but I want us to look at it here. It says, the saying is trustworthy for, and here's the song, if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. In this passage, we see multiple contrasts brought up. We see that we are united with God and with Jesus Christ in several ways. We are united with him in death. All right, He died. We are also going to die to sin. Uh, and we physically will die someday. We are united in life. As he is brought to a new life, we can have a new life. We are united with him in suffering. We are united with him in reigning someday. In the same vein, we are united when it comes to denial. In the sense that if we deny him, he's also going to deny us. But the part that we do not have in common with God comes with faith. A division comes here in the matter of faithlessness. Because if we become faithless, Jesus is not going to become faithless too because he cannot deny his own existence. If we decide to become faithless, he will remain faithful to himself. If we lose our trust in Jesus Christ, if we lose our belief that he is the Son of God, he can't join us there because to do so would be to deny his own existence and reality. That's not how it works. When it comes to the city of refuge, we need to be careful that we are not becoming looky-loos. We need to be encouraged by what we have rather than being brought down by a fear and a stress of things that we don't have. If we are in the Lord and safe in his kingdom, we don't really need anything else outside. We are provided for by him. But whenever we have a boundary, it can be very easy to look and see and try to find out if the grass is green or somewhere else. We can look at all the things that we can't do. I can't go out there and enjoy all of the parties. I can't go out there and just sleep in on Sundays or whatever you have. Yeah, there's, there are things out there that are alluring to us. We all have our own unique things that tempt us in this world. But if we're focusing all our attention on out there and the things that we want, we are missing out on the joys and the comfort and the peace that we have here. We are taken care of here. And so we need to, to be thankful for that. And why we are in him. We have a permanent security. We have his forgiveness of sins. 
We have his ear and his heart for all that we face in this life. Let's not become obsessed with the things that are outside. Let us become appreciative for the things that are here. For all of us here today, I hope that the message that God is our refuge is an encouragement for you. If you are a Christian, I hope that you can go home tonight and you can be thankful that God is here for you. But if there are one or more here that are not in Christ, know that by your sin, you have an avenger coming after you. Death is coming. God is coming for retribution for the things that we have done. And you need to run. You need to run not to a far off distance, but you need to run spiritually to the Father and heed what he asks to remain safe in him. He asks that you believe in him. He asks that you confess, that you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. He wants you to repent, turn away from your sins, and to be baptized in the watery grave of baptism, rising anew in life. If we can help you with that this evening, the waters are prepared. We are glad to help you in your walk and welcome you into the family. If we can help you in this way, please come forward as we stand and sing. Closing song will be number 446. Well, thank you, Joshua, for another excellent message. Several announcements to share with you this evening. Among our sick, uh, Norm Wilkinson has been at Belpre Landing and is now staying with his daughter Kim in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, Sherlyn English, that's Janice Christman's sister-in-law, uh, has been dealing with COVID. She was at Wheeling Hospital, and she is now at home. We extend our deepest sympathy to the family of Joanna Thomas, that's Susan Ellis's aunt. Memorial services will be held this coming Wednesday at 2 o'clock at the Hadley Funeral Home in Reno. If you are unable to partake of communion this morning, it has been prepared. During the singing of the final song, you can exit through the rear of the auditorium, uh, take a right, go up the ramp to the multi-purpose room. See, Greg Klein will meet you there. Invite you back every opportunity you have to, have to be with us as Wednesday we will continue our study of the book of Hebrews. And of course, next Sunday morning we'll continue our study of Ecclesiastes and of course, um, worship at 10. 
There is no backside tonight. I'm so used to having a backside of late. Following our final song, uh, Adam Burkhart will lead, our, our, lead us in a closing prayer. I remind you, as I did this morning, that um, Joshua is one of the men we are considering, considering as a, a potential full-time pulpit preacher in the future. Uh, so if you have anything you'd like to share, uh, your feelings about his presentation, his handling of the word, uh, you are welcome to share those thoughts with Roger or I, and we'll take those into consideration. So Tim, you're up. Number 446, 446, if you're able to please stand. Mm-hmm. When my way goeth drear, precious Lord, linger near. When my life is almost gone, hear my cry, hear my call, hold my hand, lest I fall, take my hand. Father in heaven, we thank you for this hour of worship we've been given this evening. We pray that our worship to you this evening has been in accordance with your will. We pray for those who were mentioned as being sick, those who were mentioned as suffering from the loss of loved ones. Lay your healing hand in your hand of care upon them. Be with our speaker tonight as he returns home. Keep him safe. Turn home safe to his family. Keep us all safe as we leave here tonight and bring us back to the next appointed time in Christ's name. Amen.